Hi and welcome. I'm Len Waverman, Dean of the Groot School of Business, and I'm here, as I said, to welcome you to this latest in the episodes of Knowledge Lab at the Groot School of Business. McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it's located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by a dish with one spoon wampum agreement. We have a fascinating topic for you lined up today. Terry O'Reilly joins us to discuss how emotionally driven marketing affects us in times of change. And this is certainly a time of change because we're here virtually and shares his experiences in navigating business during difficult times. And many of you are facing difficult times as our universities. You will recognize Terry as a well-known media personnel in Canada. In 1990, he co-founded Pirate Radio and Television, creative audio production company that produces scripts, sound and music for radio and television commercials. We all know his great CBC radio show, show Under the Influence, tracks over 1 million listeners per week. I'm one of the 1 million, Terry. In addition to all this, Terry regularly speaks about marketing topics as a keynote speaker. He's written two books, the latest titled, This I Know, Marketing Lessons from Under the Influence. We're thrilled, Terry, to have you with us today. And again, I wish we were able to be with you physically. Joining us, Terry, today is Associate Professor Mandeep Malik, who is one of our great marketing professors. He's been a social, he's an Associate Professor of Marketing and has been with the group since 2000. He brings extensive business expertise to his teaching role. Given his industry background in marketing, sales, and product management, but he's an experiential leader at the group and across Canada. Uh, his innovations such as Mars Apprentice, Canada's Next Top Ad Exec, and many others, really are leading marketing innovations across Canada. Thank you both for being here today. I will now pass it on to Malik, Mandeep Malik. Thank you. Well, thank you, Len, um, uh, for those gracious remarks and for giving Terry uh, uh, the intro that he needs, uh, given his fame and uh, uh, highly acknowledged thought leadership in the marketing space. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our conversation with Terry. Um, I thought this was going to be a fireside chat, but it's more, uh, you know, with a with a nice looking plant behind me and a nice looking lamp behind Terry. <laughs> How are you doing, Terry? I'm good, Mandeep. How are you doing? Good. Uh, just some housekeeping notes uh, for those tuning in. Um, there will be a Q&A period. Uh, Terry and I will be taking questions from you. So uh, please post your questions in the Q&A function. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Kindly also note that this particular webinar, this event, I should say, is being recorded. Um, and will be used by the university and the DeGroote School of Business for some promotional purposes um, to share with our students and other stakeholders. Um, if you have any questions regarding that, please contact our marketing and community engagement team. And um, of course, we would love your feedback. So uh, once this webinar is over and you have um, reflected on and digested some of uh, the issues that Terry and I have spoken about and you have thoughts on that, come back to us, let us know, uh, and we will use it as we plan content into 2021, which I promise you is going to be a better year, and, um, and also use it to bring to light some other uh, new pieces of knowledge and uh, emerging research from DeGroote that could be of value to you. So Terry, shall we take this away? Yeah, I'm all ready. So here, here now, we are chatting about emotion in marketing, Terry. And I think nothing speaks to emotion 
like the name of a brand. And that's what I wanted your opinion on first. What does a brand name communicate? What does it come to mean to its consumers, its customers? Well, I think a brand name is so incredibly important because over time, a brand takes on a secondary meaning, a brand name. So, you know, if you think of what Pepsi Cola means, it, it means almost nothing. <laughs> if you go back to the 18, late 1800s, but over time with all the marketing Pepsi has done and, and the emotions Pepsi was able to strike in their advertising, that brand becomes a thing. It becomes a personality. It becomes, you know, it stands for something different than something else in its category. You know, Pepsi has always positioned itself as the drink for the young generation, you know, trying to position Coke as the older generation. And Pepsi Cola, Pepsi just took on that uh, that entire meaning. And so that that brand name, even though Coca-Cola and Pepsi Cola both have cola in the name, Pepsi, for example, became to, uh, over time to stand for something. So there's that. And I also think that a great brand name really becomes memorable. That's why so much time goes into thinking of a great brand name. Um, the trick is to try and not pick something that's generic or is, is hard to defend or protect. Well, we named our company Pirate Radio and Television. I mean, we could only protect it in the radio and television category. We couldn't protect it anywhere else because pirate, of course, is a word in the dictionary and you can never own a word in the dictionary. So, whereas Xerox, you could own because it was a completely coined name. But all that aside, I still think a brand name is one of the most important aspects of a product. So, and I've always wondered about this, even though I've been immersed in the world of marketing for so many years, it's a question that still comes up every day. Why do these intangibles that we cannot touch, that we cannot acquire mean so much? Right? Why can't the product form and shape and specifications, what we consume be of more importance than the emotion around a brand? That's, that, that is a very important question in marketing. And I think it's, you have to realize that a brand is made up of intangibles, that most of the value of a brand is in the intangibles. It's almost not on the balance sheet. And I know that marketers, you know, uh, I think it was, um, it's a great advertiser in England, whose name I'm just uh, forgetting for a moment. Anyway, he has this great line where he says that advertisers go down on their knees every night and pray that advertising is a science and it never will be. It is still an art. It's, it, it is the art of persuasion, the art of creating a personality. It's just, it's a, it's an applied art, right? It's not you know, there's two kinds of art in the world. There's the art that, a, you know, uh, a musician or an artist just paints for self-expression. Then there's applied art, commercial art, which is the business we're in, which is applying artistic and creative solutions to business problems. So, so much of that is the art. So that's why a brand is really driven by its intangibles. It's driven by its personality, how it stands out in the marketplace, uh, how authentic it is, how it it doesn't walk the walk and talk the talk, or is it, is it a, a thin facade? All of that drives a brand in the marketplace. If you're just a commodity, if you're just competing on price, uh, you probably don't need a great personality. But then again, you're, it's a race to the bottom when you're, when you're competing on price. You know, Apple computers are some of the most expensive computers on the market yet people will line up a day ahead of time to get a new Apple product and no one will ever do that for Dell. So therefore, Mar Apple has a, you know, a greater personality, a greater brand, may many more intangibles, and they have a greater margin in, as a result. So there you are, that's, that's the value of intangibles. And, and you know, this is an interesting fight that um, chief marketing officers have at the boardroom table, Terry, because they are representing their views and their campaigns and their budgets to somebody who's signing off and wants numbers to determine what she or he is signing off on. 
right? The CFO, the CEO, they want research evidence, they want numerical data. And we as marketers talk in terms of the emotions we are creating, the, you know, the meeting of two intangibles, right? The emotion of the customer and the intangible value and personality of a brand. How do you explain this to somebody who is a number cruncher? It's a tough one. I mean, that is, that is the constant battle in a boardroom, as you say. Um, I mean, there has to be return on investment in all marketing. And I mean, there's a lot of ways, especially in this new digital era, this, you know, the 21st century where you can track results. The problem is, and the reason that advertising agencies really don't get paid uh, as a result of how many products they sell, they get paid more uh, a fee is because the selling of a product goes through a lot of channels and a lot of hands that advertising agencies can't control. Like where you are on the shelf in a grocery store, ad agencies have no control over that. How much product is on that shelf or how much of a shelf facing a brand gets, advertising agencies have no control over that. Distribution, uh, operating uh, uh, issues, agencies have no control over that. So there's a lot is a brand gets sold because of a lot more things other than the marketing and the advertising. So to be held accountable to the penny for return on investment is a very difficult proposition. But that said, you still want to create a brand, nurture that brand, and then do research to make sure that it's, it's resonating with customers. I think the best research is really what matters to customers. As a writer, I loved research. I didn't love researching creative ideas because I, I find that's a very flawed process. But what I really wanted research on was what is meaningful to customers? What does this product do for their life? Uh, is it very different from what competitors are offering or is it exactly the same? And if it's the same, how can we differentiate it just with personality if there isn't a product uh, difference? Like all of that research fed into great advertising. And I think that is, that's where a lot of the value is. But if you're sitting across from a number cruncher who's the CEO, or if the chief, uh, you know, the, the chief marketing officer came up through another end of the business, it's a very tough sell. And I think back in the day, uh, Mandeep, when I started in the business, most of the, the marketing officers were really career people that, that spent their entire careers in marketing. They didn't come out of accounting. And even the founders of the company were, you know, were still had their hands on the product. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the big uh, problem and the big danger going forward with the companies as it evolves and as people take on new roles within a company, you get too many bean counters in the, in the business. And it's, it's, a, it's a problem because half of that business is intangible. So go going back to research you were talking about and this, um, this you know, the bean counters wanting evidence and science. Given your experiences, do you believe marketing research can actually be used to predict um, and forecast emotions and uh, identify those motivators that people will respond to because they are the innermost feelings that have been explored by research and the product or the brand has been positioned against those feelings, given those feelings. Yeah, I think, uh, I think research is a very, very important tool. It's usually a snapshot in time, Mandeep. I don't think research can predict the future. I really, I'm really skeptical of that. Research can tell you the opportunities you've missed. Research is great for hindsight analysis. Um, but uh, again, I think you want to know as much about your potential customer or existing customer as possible and research can reveal a lot of that. You know, then on the other hand, it's interesting to me that Steve Jobs never used research. He didn't believe in it. He said, you can't ask customers to imagine something they might want. You have to give it to them. So he never did any research as far as what, what products would be uh, interesting to people, uh, what are they looking for in their life? He didn't do that. He relied on his own instincts. And on top of that, which maybe we can get into later, Jobs did all his advertising in traditional media. He almost did no advertising online. Very interesting for, for a, a groundbreaking computer guy, right? 
Yeah, and, and you know, the, the dilemma that people like Steve Jobs create for the rest of the world is that, you know, maybe marketing is not as much of a science as we think it is. Maybe intuition matters. Maybe, you know, you do need to be able to be a visionary who can forecast and see where people are headed and be there long before they get there, right? So you can give them something aspirational. So talking about that, talking about, you know, Steve Jobs, do you, based on your familiarity with the Apple brand, do you, can you identify a persuasive emotion that you saw Apple constantly using? Yeah, I can. So I worked for Shia Day, was the last agency I worked for before I started Pirate. And of course, Shia Day was Apple's advertising agency. Uh, I worked there in the 80s, if you remember the great 1984 commercial, which aired in 1984, which has kind of been lauded as maybe the greatest TV commercial of all time was a Shia Day uh, creation too. So I got to work with Lee Clow, who was the creative director on the Apple account, et cetera. So I had kind of a first front row uh, seat there Here's what, what's so interesting to, about Apple to me. Steve Jobs positioned Apple with 1984, with that commercial in particular, as a company that was uh, taking the power of computers away from corporations and monoliths like IBM and giving it to the individual. So it was that kind of pirates versus the Navy uh, you know, emotion he was tapping into. And if you look at the storyline of 1984, you see that woman, if, it, if you know the commercial, you know, you see kind of a big brother dystopian scenario and this woman comes running in and swings this hammer and smashes the screen. And I mean, that was always Jobs. If you look at every commercial Apple's done since 1984, it's always an individual accomplishing something. There's never really groups in an Apple commercial. And that was the essence of Steve Jobs pitch to the world was he was going to heroically lasso power. Like he was going to jump the moat, swing across the IBM moat, you know, raid the castle and give all the power to the individual. And that's the emotion that he tapped into. And I think that was so powerful, Mandeep. That's why people line up around the block to this day to get their hands on an Apple product. It touched why my 90 year old parents own Apple products. That sentiment just resonated so powerfully to this day that it is all about giving power to the individual. And, and it just was such a, a hugely persuasive emotion. And you believe we as consumers respond to that emotion with our checkbooks and yeah, our credit cards? I do. You know, yeah. just, you know, to use big, uh, signposts. If you look at Nike, <clears throat> the emotion in Nike commercials is always about trying to achieve something, you know, just do it is really another word for get up off the couch and try it, try something. Uh, you know, 80% of the people in the world don't, don't that wear Nikes don't exercise. And I always find that an interesting stat because what that tells me is they are drawn to just do it as a sentiment not necessarily working out as a sentiment because just do it can apply to so many aspects of your life. It's like, should I start my own business? Should I speak up when I think I'm the only one in the room with a different attitude? Should I pop the big question? You know, all of those things, just do it just says, you know, take a chance. Yeah. And that emotion uh, in that line, which has been running since the eighties, is so, is so powerful, Mandeep, that it drives Nike sales. And as I said, 80% of the people who wear Nike uh, apparel do not work out. Like they've, it's actually separated from the, the concept of actual uh, you know, physical exercise. And that's how powerful that, that's, that statement is. Talking of Nike, I mean, you know, today they have used their broad shoulders and their presence to carry social causes. Yeah. And, you know, um, do you applaud that? Do you worry about that as a marketer? Do you 
question them and say, why are you doing this? You know, why don't you just stick with apparel and shoes and do what you do well? It's interesting that the 21st century has changed uh, 100 years of marketing. In other words, for the first 100 years of modern marketing, being the 20th century, brands never stated their political affiliations. That was seen as not their job, not their right. And, and, it, and of course they ran the, um, you know, the danger of, of alienating 50% of their, of their target market, right? Because you've got, if it's in the States, Democrats and Republicans, as we're seeing the division down there now. Um, so it's very interesting that in the 21st century, people are demanding to know where a brand stands. They want to know who they're spending money with. They want to know what the values of that company are. That was never on the table in the, in the 20th century. It really, really wasn't. So brands have to do it now. They kind of have to declare their values. And uh, it's, it's interesting that Nike does that. I mean, just the way they backed up Ka Kaepernick through all of his ordeal, kept paying his salary, even though no F NFL team would hire him to this day, by the way. And, uh, you know, and then we saw a couple of Super Bowls back when all, so many advertisers took a stand against Trump in their advertising, Airbnb, a lot of, you know, which their main, mo their, you know, their motto and their mission statement is bringing people together. And they felt Trump was trying to divide people. So even in their Super Bowl ads, which, you know, biggest audience, most expensive ads of the year, they took a stand and lots of other brands did too. So that is a recent phenomenon that I think will continue as time goes on from this point on. So, you know, if I may, uh, clarify this. So as a people, you know, we look to brands to give us solutions to problems, to give us something that we will enjoy wearing or perform really well in. Are we now looking to brands to give us, uh, uh, you know, some direction on values, some clarity on choosing right from wrong? Are brands the new religion? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, I think that's an awful lot to put on, on, a, on a company. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting question you ask. I think, I think brands just are, are being forced into that scenario where they have to state their values, as I was saying earlier. Uh, I mean, you're asking, can a brand not just exist on what it provides and not have to state all its values? I just don't think, I think those days are past. I think, I think they're becoming intertwined now. What, what does the product do? What is the benefit? What are the values and what are the personality? And the values really, as I said, were never really a big part of that equation. Corporations are also kind of in a, in a catch 22 or corporations more than smaller companies, but they, you know, they, if they don't state their values, they are criticized. And if they state their values, they are criticized. So it's a, it's a difficult spot for them right now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think everybody is sort of, you know, caught in this constant dilemma and, you know, people don't know if they are making good choices, r the right choices, and they have to turn to these, uh, you know, lighthouses and say, is that a good choice, right? Is there a better choice? What are the repercussions of this choice? Um, but of course, uh, you know, brands have to join uh, the sentiment felt in society and at least, uh, make people to some extent believe that, hey, you are on the right path, we support you, and you know, we are willing to be the brave hearts you need us to be so that the community grows larger. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I'm, I'm writing my first episodes of my radio shows at uh, 2021 season right now. And the show I'm working on right now is the working title is Brands Crushed by Zeitgeist. So, I'm talking about that very issue in a different way. So I'm talking about how Aunt Jemima's had to rebrand because of its racist origins and Uncle Ben's rice and 
even how Vic Victoria's Secret is being crushed by the Me Too movement, objectifying women. Like so, as of July of, of 2020, so much change took place because of the George Floyd uh, murder that uh, you're seeing brands being really uh, having to to finally respond to to criticism of the, of their values. It's a very interesting thing. Like. like for example, the black population has had trouble with Aunt Jemima for decades. In the civil rights uh, era of the 60s, they demanded changes with Aunt Jemima and really nothing had taken place. Like the brand really didn't make any big changes. In 1989, they changed the logo on the boxes to be less of a slave imagery you know, with the red bandana and the apron and made Aunt Jemima more of a businesswoman, pearl earrings and its business suit and a white lace blouse. That was 1989, that was the only act acquiescence the brand made. And then as of July, 2020, they are totally changing everything. We haven't seen the new branding yet, but it took that Black Lives Matter movement. Even Eskimo pie, this, another story I'm pursuing, Eskimo pie, because Eskimo, the word, is uh, offensive to the Inuit. And the Washington Redskins having to change their name after, being, after saying they would never change their yep. name. And I was listening to a blog uh, or, or I was listening to a podcast, two black uh, hosts were talking about the Washington Redskins. And they said, you know, we've heard it for so long, the name Washington Redskins, that you don't even think about it. But they said, if it was the Washington Blackskins, you would be outraged. So you understand how the Native Americans and, you know, would, would feel about a, a name like that. So brands are being forced finally to uh, review their values. So you know, as a marketing thought leader, somebody who studies this domain closely, you've seen the 80s, you've seen the 90s, you've you know, seen the uh, 2000 to 2010 decade. Have emotions changed? What people, what were the pervasive emotions, uh, the most persuasive emotions that people felt um, two decades ago, not the most persuasive emotions today? I would say no, surprisingly. So with, <clears throat> with the exception of values, co corporate values, company values having to be part of the equation now, I think the interesting notion about marketing is something I think that Bill Burnback said many, who's my personal hero in the business, said many, many decades ago that the study of advertising is the study of the unchanging man. And what he meant by that, he meant mankind, right? But what he meant by that was that all of our needs and wants and desires never, ever change. You know, it's to be successful, to be healthy, to provide for our families, have a roof over our head, to have purpose in life. All of those things have not changed probably since cave, <laughs> caveman days, if you want to go back that far. So that means that the the emotions that marketing wants to tap into or at least present are the same emotions that have always been around from the 40s, the 50s, the 30s, the 20s, the 21st century. It's, it never ever, my, and I agree with this. This is my personal opinion. I, I'm aligned with Burnback on this. I don't think they ever really change. So, you know, I know you mentioned Apple. I know you mentioned Nike. Are there other brands that you personally admire for the emotions they communicate, either based on the values they stand for or other design principles or their communication platforms? Yeah, there are. I mean, I do an episode of my radio show every year called Brand Envy, uh -huh. <clears throat> where I kind of isolate or identify five brands that, that I love, or not that I love, that I admire for various reasons. So every year, I mean, it's never hard to find those brands, by the way, when it comes to writing that show, it's, it's a pretty easy write. <clears throat> but there are, there are lots of brands out there that I love, just because mostly because they, they, they uh, continue to exist. In other words, they last. That's one of my biggest criteria for a brand is that they last over time. So, um, and then there's the personality aspect of brands. I love what WestJet does as a rule. I think they use a lot of emotion in their advertising. And I think they do, <clears throat> they do it so well that I think Air Canada has tried to emulate them. You know, the bigger, the bigger monolith trying to emulate the smaller airline. 
And you see that with their Christmas videos they do every year, which are so wonderful. And then you look at smaller uh, retailers like Roots. I love what Roots does. They've kind of carved out a personality. They're all about being outside, being outdoors, respecting the outdoors. Everything about that brand is, is attractive to me. And, and I love their even the design work that goes into a Roots product. Even the label on the back of a shirt or a sweater is an interesting thing for me. They, they're one of those brands that cares about every single little detail. We, uh, one of the, uh, we get meals from HelloFresh uh, once a week, which is really thriving in a pandemic situation, by the way. Talk about a company in the right place at the right time and in an unfortunate time. But uh, so they send ready-made food, as you may know, they send meals, you have to prepare them. It takes less than 30 minutes, but the amount of detail, Mandeep, that's in the packaging, the box it arrives in, the way it's packaged, <clears throat> how everything, almost, I think 98% of it is recyclable. The menu cards they send to you are so beautifully designed. Again, there is a company that cares about the details. And I'm always fascinated and I always admire companies that care about every single little detail. So it's not just what you're saying, it's in every element that you put out there, your product design, how you influence the consumer buying journey, the layout of the store, the label or tag, all of that matters. All of it, every single bit of it, every single touch point with a customer is part of your marketing program. Even at Pirate, and I've said this before, at Pirate, we used to record on hold messages, really funny ones, so that even our on hold message was a piece of creativity. It wasn't, you know how you're on hold with a lot of companies, they're just either giving you bad music or they're trying to sell you on other, other sale prices. Well, it's, it's almost unlistenable. At Pirate, we made them funny. And because we wanted every single touch point to uh, exemplify our creativity because creativity was our product. And we would even get people after a while calling up our reception saying, and the reception would say, who would you want to speak to? They said, we just want to be put on hold. So people just wanted to hear the on hold messages. So, and I think that spoke well of our, of our company. And, and uh, again, just looking at another detail that even an on hold message is marketing yeah. and it should be handled creatively and not, and it shouldn't be a, a, a big bat you wield to bludgeon your customers into sale prices. That's fascinating. So, you know, given what you're talking about, I presume you're suggesting that sound and music, what is said and sometimes what is left unsaid to the imagination of the customer, that too plays a part in creating some emotion? Totally. Music tells you how to feel. So if you look at the way music is used in advertising and you look at the way music is used in films, sometimes the music Often music will cue a scene. It'll tell you how to feel before the scene unfolds. It'll be dramatic or tense or romantic. It's music tells you how to feel. Therefore in marketing, the same rule applies that you, you choose a piece of music to underscore. When I, was, when I was directing commercials, I would assign music a role the same way I would assign actors a role. So if there was if I wanted empathy to be part of the commercial, I would choose an empathetic piece of music because I want that heavy lifting to be done by the music so I could free my actors up to deliver other points or to, or to have a more realistic dialogue. So music was integral to what I was trying to achieve emotionally. And it's like, it's like you know, movies, you know, 80% of a movie is great casting. And I always said the same thing applied to commercials that if you got the right actors in the room, you just stand back and let them bring their magic. And I think the same applies to production values and one of which is music and sound and especially music because it, 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 music is purely emotional. There's no other, it's not math, it's not science. It's not, you can't even, you can't see it, you can only hear it and feel it. And that's why music is so powerful. So dare I ask, when is emotion too much emotion? I think when it's, I think my answer to that is when it's 
when emotion is trying to be manipulated. So when I say that great advertising should have an emotional element to it, I don't mean to manipulate an existing emotion. What I mean is it should not just be straight facts and figures, price and item. It should be a personality. It should make somebody smile or laugh or think or, or, you know, or enjoy the story you've just unfolded. They have some kind of visceral reaction to the commercial. That's what I mean when I say it should contain some emotion. Because the reason most people hate advertising is a lot of advertising is either badly done or it's just screaming at you or it contains like a false emotion where they're trying to manufacture an emotion that doesn't really exist. So I say just for brands to be themselves, create commercials that are worth intruding on a show because every commercial is an intrusion to try and make that intrusion the most polite intrusion possible and to give somebody a little something back for spending 30 seconds with you, be it a smile or just some kind of visceral reaction to, to marketing. Because so much advertising elicits no reaction and just, and just kind of uh, ignites a, a, a hatred of the media, of the, of the business. So if we were to take some of these uh, insights that you are talking about, Terry, do you, would you say that this applies to business to business marketing? You know, I teach a business to business consultative selling course um, to our MBA students and senior undergrads. And we talk about decision-making units and how purchasing departments have been created so that they can disconnect the user's emotion from the commercial transaction, right? Yeah. Somebody can protect the commercial interests of this economic activity. Do you believe in that domain to emotion matters? I do. I know that I did a lot of business to business marketing in my career. And I understand the dynamics are somewhat different because a, you know, a purchaser or a purchasing department is, is sometimes putting out a lot of the company's money to purchase raw materials or a brand new computer system for the entire company. It could be you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So there's a lot riding on those decisions. But I still believe that there's emotion because I think because there's so much riding on that decision, Mandeep, I think people are very emotional about it. Yes, there's a rational side. There's, you know, just doing the math of the expenditure versus, you know, the budget, which is always the, the, the sturm und drang of uh, purchasing something for companies. But I still think there's a lot of emotion in that decision. And therefore, I think business to business marketing can also contain a lot of emotion. When I was doing business to business marketing for Fiberglass Canada and for DuPont, think companies of that nature where they had, you know, multiple products with multiple target uh, groups. We always injected uh, personality and emotion into those, into those ads. So if you're asking, does business to business, is business to business exempt from that? I think only bad business to business advertising has no emotion in it. So, you know, we've talked about the big brands. We've talked about the need for corporations with multiple segments, multiple needs to target, multiple geographies to target. What's your message to a small business, Terry, to a small retailer on the main street who is, you know, doesn't have budget, doesn't have deep pockets? What do they do? How do they survive, uh, especially, you know, in these times? Well, <clears throat> my overall message to small companies is to be bold. That's always my mantra is to be bold in your marketing because being bold makes up for a, goes a long way to make up for a lack of budget. Um, you know, it's interesting at Pirate, we, you know, over my career there and deep because uh, I worked, you know, I was at Pirate till I sold my interest in my company to my partners in 2012, but I'd been there for almost 25 years, started at 25 years in 1990. Our favorite clients were small businesses. So we were doing work for Molson and Labatt's and I mean, all the Petro Canada, like all the big brands you can think of, we did work for, but our favorite brand, our favorite jobs were the small retailers, small businesses, because they were feisty and because they were bold. 
And because they knew they, they didn't have the budget, so they knew they had to do something creative to get noticed. Because, you know, attention is the oxygen of marketing, right? So we always did our best work. We always did our most award-winning work for the smallest clients. And that award-winning work, by the way, was the engine that was the, that was the engine on the pirate train. In other words, all the awards we won for the small businesses attracted all the big accounts like the Molsons and the Labats and the, you know, the Air Canada's, et cetera, came on board as a result of the work we did for small clients. So that's how important it was to us. But the reason we won the awards and we were able to sell a lot of products for small companies was because we did bold work for them. So my first rule is be bold. My second rule for a small company is to, is to ask the question, what's your greatest area of opportunity? In other words, don't spend your money in, in you know, a dozen places thinly, spend a lot of money in three places well. So, and I think a lot of small companies make the mistake of trying to, to uh, appeal to too many target markets when they could really dive deep into a few and spend more money and more time and more effort against a greater area of opportunity. And a, just a very quick story on, to uh, underscore this point. The Ontario Wine Council came to us once and they wanted to increase the number of uh, people buying their VQA wines, Mandeep. So VQA wines are the, are, if you have that distinction yeah. on your wine bottle, that's the top of the line. It's yeah. gone through lots of criteria and to get to have that distinction. So we asked them, how do you, how do you want to, uh, to get more sales for VQA wines? Like, what are you thinking? And they said, well, we need, more, we need more buyers. We need more people to buy VQA wines. We need new wine drinkers. And the more we thought about it, it just didn't seem like the right thing to do because they had a small budget. So we went back to them and said, instead of trying to attract new wine drinkers, what if we got existing VQA buyers to buy one more bottle a year, not a month, a year? And they said, that would be huge for us. I said, we said, that's the, what you should be doing because that's a warm call. That's not a cold call to new wine drinkers who were maybe diehard beer drinkers. You're trying to convince them to drink a different, you know, category. Why not talk to people who love you already and just see, I said, surely we can convince them to buy one more bottle a year. That can't be an insurmountable uh, task. So that's what we did. That was the greatest area of opportunity and it ended up being very successful for them. And you know, talking about money, Terry, um, and the need for attention and customer attention being the oxygen for marketers. Yet, you know, and I've seen this across three continents, the first budget to get chopped in times of recession, in difficult times, when the shoe is pinching, let's cut the marketing budget. Yeah. Why? That is, that's always been the case. The smartest marketers don't do that, of course. Now it's hard to look at your sales dropping through the floor in times of recession and then in, you know, stick with your advertising budget. But the smartest marketers do because they make up a lot of ground when it, because the category gets very quiet. Yep. The marketing landscape gets very quiet and it's, it's much easier to stand out and a smart marketer can make a lot, you know, make up a lot of ground on market share in, in a recessionary time. And especially when the economy eventually bounces back, then they're in a much better position than they were before. But it's a very difficult um, decision to make. It takes a very bold and courageous marketer to say, we're not cutting our marketing budget. I mean, even the smartest ones would probably increase their marketing budget because they know that the category is gonna go very quiet. So, I mean, that's been the age old problem of people cutting back. Advertising, I always said, I, I, I experienced this over and over again. By the way, Mandeep, I started my career in 1981 when I got out of university as a copywriter right into the 1981 recession. Then I co-founded Pirate in 1990, in the 1990-91 soft recession. Then we expanded to New York City. We opened up four recording studios in New York City in the Great Recession. So the, the, the three big signposts of my career have all been recessions, not on purpose, but uh, that nonetheless was the, the uh, scenario. And what was interesting about that was as difficult as it was in each of those three beats, trying to find a job, trying to launch a company, then trying to survive in Manhattan in, during the Great Recession, is that 
you start lean. So when we started Pirate, we started in a recessionary period where all the advertising budgets pulled back and shrunk and we had to figure out how to survive in that. So then when the next recession came around, we had already, we'd, we'd been there already. We'd already weathered that kind of a storm. So we knew how to do that. And I think that's the silver lining of, of uh, being in a recession in the early years of a company, rather than starting in a roaring economy and then finding yourself in a recession and panicking. So that was the, the, the upside to us. But again, marketing in a recession is a difficult time for most companies. They, they pull their horns in instead of taking advantage of it. Are there uh, companies, brands that you feel over the last eight months have been bold, have been courageous, have spoken to the marketplace in a tone and manner that's empathetic rather than sympathetic? You know, it's interesting when I watch TV commercials, I don't see that many ads acknowledging the pandemic anymore. And it seemed to be just for a small brief amount of time. Like I don't see any commercials with people with masks on and that's our reality right now. Like I really, I think it's only government commercials I see talking about or showing people with masks on. I worry about marketers trying to encourage people to shut, to come to their stores to shop because in this, like we're being kind of told to social distance. So marketers have to be responsible that way. I know they need sales. It's a very difficult time for people, for companies right now, but to encourage people to come into malls and shop or whatever, I think it's, it's a little dangerous right now. And um, it's just a, like I remember seeing an early an ad early on that I quite liked. It was an A and W ad. You know they've had their spokesperson, that little yep. funny guy, for a long time. One of the first ads after the stay at home, uh, shelter in place um, regulations or rules came out. They he did a, a a commercial from his house in his t shirt, and really low quality. Yes, you right. remember that one? Yeah, yeah. I thought that, that's so smart because I didn't see anybody else doing that. Like actually you know, saying, this is how we're going to do our commercial. We're going to have our guy do it at home in his t-shirt through his Zoom. <laughs> and I thought, good on you, a and for doing that. Yeah, they are. They're very real in their communication, very authentic, very genuine. Yeah. And that, um, I, I dare, dare I say their burgers taste better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan too, by the way. And you know what? They have a great agency too. Rethink is just such a smart, smart advertising agency. They are brilliant. I admire so much of what they do. Yeah. So, you know, the, the recession is, um, it, you know, COVID seems like it's not going away for another two quarters. Um, what do you say to WestJet, Terry, that, you know, you think they do great advertising, they're uh, their connectivity with their customers is very authentic. Now they are selling a product or a service that can be sold, but cannot be consumed, right? Um, what do you say to them? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if there's a silver bullet answer to that, Mandeep. Um, I mean, I liked when airlines, when they started to slowly come back, they were not selling the middle seats. In other words, they were trying to social distance. If you must travel, we're trying to make it safe. And they, they apparently improved their circulation systems in their planes. Then I seem, I, I seem to think that went away. The selling of the middle seat went away very quickly and now everybody's packed in. Like I was just reading that the amount of travel in the US right now for Thanksgiving this week is greater than it was two years ago. Like the, the numbers of people flying are higher than they were in, in 2018. I mean, it's, it's not good. It's not good. Um, some locations like, uh, you know, a, a, uh, like Bruce County, like, you know, areas of Ontario are selling themselves as uh, the, uh, the nature part of their uh, area. So not coming into stores, but come and hike and come and see this and come and get maple syrup or whatever. So they're finding ways to try and still generate some revenue by, by using their, ex, their, their nature as a, a goal. Right through the uh, pandemic, even in uh, you know, March and April and May when it was really new and, and everybody was sheltering in place, I was amazed to see um, 
Caribbean vacations and, and cruise lines advertising. Like it was astounding to me that uh, they were still advertising, spending big money on CNN and MSNBC and all the big stations in the middle of a, of a lockdown. And uh, <laughs> so there's you know, still some tourism operators out there that just didn't acknowledge it at all. Well, isn't Barbados offering a one-year visa? You can come and work remotely from there and spend your hard-earned money to... <laughs> I did not hear that. Is that right? Okay, there you go. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, but then somebody told me, uh, Facebook told its employees, you can go anywhere in the world to work. We will pay you based on cost of living. Wow. <laughs> Wow. So nobody left. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's that whole other reality too, Mandeep, of uh, companies realizing that their employees can work from home and actually be, if not as productive or more productive. Because, you know, everybody's been very leery of that uh, historically, that if you're working from home, you're really watching Oprah for two hours and then working at from 4.30 to 5, you know? And I think companies have, uh, have discovered that. Even my my daughter's fiance, I mean, you know, his company sent, you know, he's working from home. He has never been in his office. He got hired by a company, Mandeep, and has never set foot in their office because the second he got hired, they locked down. But they gave him this big, not big, but they gave him a very healthy uh, amount of money to set up a home office. So it's not just work from home. Here's money to buy a desk, a chair, a computer. Like it was, you know, an amazing thing. And the only business I wouldn't want to be in in the next little while is commercial real estate. Because I think a lot of companies are going to go, hmm, we don't need this much square footage. We can send most of our departments home and not have to pay all that rent. So I think that's going to be a big change in downtown Toronto and all the big urban centers. Yeah, I think the early, early indicators from the city of Toronto are that they will be saving $31 million in their annual budget uh, just based on space that's freed up. And that's huge. Uh, yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, turning to my life, Terry, what do you say to me? I work with, you know, young 20 somethings, um, many of whom believe there really, you know, there is no formula to marketing. I have been a consumer for 20 years. I know what marketing is because I know how to feel as a consumer. Yet these people go into the world of work. They need to be prepared. Uh, what's your advice for me? What should I be focusing on as an instructor of marketing? Um, what are some of the learning outcomes that I should guarantee? Well, I think there's so much to learn in the field of marketing. So, you know, I've been in the business for almost 40 years, Mandeep, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. So to think you know it all in your 20s is, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty laughable to be quite frank with you. Um, I, think, um, I think a lot of history is good. One of the biggest reasons I have a lot of history in my radio show is when you can see how a trend in marketing started and why and how it was used, it makes so much more sense to you now. Because if you're just jumping on board the train, let's say in testimonials, why, were tes why have testimonials always been around in advertising? When did they start? Why did they start? Why do real estate agents always show their faces in their ads? Like it's a service business, just like advertising, except advertising never shows their face. Why is that? What was the genesis of that? And once you realize what the genesis of that was, then you understand why the marketing is the way it is, right? And in the case of, of real estate marketing, back in the early days, realtors weren't organized and there were a lot of charlatans in the business that would literally sell you a piece of swampland in Florida. You know, you get off the train in your new town, you just spent money on buying a patch of land and that land doesn't exist. Realtors realized that in order to get people to trust them, they had to put their faces in their ads. They had to be accountable. And once you understand that part of real estate, then you understand why it is the way it is today, right? So understanding a lot of marketing history, understanding the great legendary marketing campaigns of the past because they inform everything that's being done now is a, is a part of it. I'm a big, big fan of that. I think looking at award annuals from around the world, 
going to the Cannes Advertising Festival or at least seeing the reel is one of the greatest instruction manuals in our business. You can reverse engineer an ad and figure out why does why is this ad so good? Like why what is it about this ad that's so powerful? And just pick it apart and understand how it was designed and created and conceptualized. So I think to answer your question in a roundabout way, I think young people need to know that there's a lot to know about it. Just because you've been on a plane doesn't mean you can be a pilot, right? Just because you've been a consumer doesn't mean you're going to be a great marketer. You have to learn all the how do. You, well, how does positioning work? How, how does media repetition work? Uh, how, does, how does a headline work versus a, a graphic? Like what, what is the, what's the decision-making? Is, is it a big headline and a small graphic or is it a big graphic and a small? Like all of that is about experience, right? How do you design an ad? How do you bring emotion into social media? Because it's not no longer prints and it's, it's a different medium. So how do you do that? Who's doing it well? What can we learn from them? So my answer to you is I think young people have a lot to learn about the business because it's, uh, it's like I say, I'm, I'm 40 years deep in the business and I still learn something almost once a week in this business still. Well, that's incredible to hear, um, Terry. A, a student for life is the best kind of student. And uh, that's what we need in our classrooms, of course. I fight the notion of, you know, you being 20 something and feeling invincible. Yeah. Um, but soon as uh, soon as these students correct their notions, it's hard to even take up a case study with them from the 90s. Like, yeah. Let's talk about, you know, what's happening now. Let's not talk about what was happening 30 years ago. It's like, well, yeah. what's happening now is informed by what happened 30 years ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. And, and I, know, I know what you mean by that. Even when near the end of my time directing commercials, I, you know, be talking to a young writer about a casting spec and, uh, and they'd be describing a character. And I would say, is it, is it something like Chandler and Friends? And they go, I, I don't know Friends. And I think, you know, that's not that long ago. And you should, you should have a wider uh, spectrum on your, on your signposts. You know, it's, like I knew all the people my dad used to love and my mom used to love in movies and music. And I was aware of Sinatra and, you know, and all of their generation signposts. So I just think a smart marketer has to be aware of pop culture. And that means going forward and going backward because it all, so much of our work draws on pop culture. And, uh, and then, then when you get into the weeds of marketing, it draws on, on the, the, the precepts of marketing of like what, what does positioning mean, and and how do you how do you sell a, a low interest product, and how do you sell consumer packaged goods, and then how do you sell a service which is invisible? Like FedEx is an invisible, like you can't hold, you can't point to FedEx. Like it's a someone comes and gets a package and goes. Like it's a service. How do you sell a service? All of that is valuable learning that ha that literally takes years to absorb. And I think smart marketers want that. They want to know. And they'll be as excited about the history of the business as where it's going now. And I think there's almost never been a better time to be in marketing than now because there's just, it's so exciting. It, like the social media, et cetera, has opened up so many more channels to be creative. So, you know, given your, your work over the last decade, Terry, can I now start calling you a marketing historian? You know what? I, I would not be insulted by that, Mandeep, because I love advertising history. I just absorb it. I, I'm constantly buying books. Like I'm reading one now that was written, I think in the 40s, maybe called Sparks Off My Anvil by uh, an advertising, a founder of an old advertising agency. But what, what I love about the old books is they weren't they weren't sidetracked by award shows or the glory of advertising, or it was all about selling. It was all about understanding what made something work. What makes a brand click? What do people need to hear? How do you not create inauthentic work? Like what, you know, all of it is just so fundamental that I love it. Because when you listen to my show, Mandeep, I'm a, I'm a fundamentals guy. I'm almost always talking about strategy. 
my radio show started 15 years ago, started really as a, a, a show about creativity, meaning just the creativity of ads, because I was a creative guy my whole career, but it very quickly morphed into a show about strategy. And my show really is a show about strategies. Like what's the underlying strategy of this campaign? What were they trying to achieve? This is how this, how they arrived at this idea all the way back at the strategic point. So fundamentals is really the, the basic. When you, I'm a martial artist and you are talking about having a, a student mentality. I call it a white belt mentality where you start off in martial arts as a white belt. Like you're, you're really just absorbing and learning. And uh, I really believe that you want to always learn. You want to be a perpetual student. Well, I hope to remain under the influence, Terry. Here's to you. <laughs> Here's to you too, Mandy. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Well, uh, here we are, open for questions. Um, thanks once again, Terry. And I have a whole host of them. I know I won't be able to go through many, but uh, let me start with uh, some of the ones that have been liked by others. Yeah. Um, here's one that's really uh, relevant to what we are seeing in the marketplace today. And this is uh, 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 one of our viewers is looking for your thought on the influencer culture and how even big brands like Nike are now collaborating with um, music artists and um, you know, maybe even streetwear brands to be able to drive new merchandise interest. Yes, that, that is a, a huge trend in this era right now. And it's not just uh, artists. There are, you know, uh, well, I'll say private uh, influencers, meaning not celebrity influencers. Uh, there's even a, an, a, a talent agency in Toronto, for example, that, that represents influencers. That's, that's the only talent they represent. So it's become, a, it's become a big thing. It's become almost an occupation now. And do you believe influencers have the capacity to give momentum to emotion, to be able to connect at a more human level than brands can through its traditional voice and form on social or print or? I, I do. I think there's a lot of regulations that have materialized around the concept of being an influencer. So you have to be upfront about the fact you're being paid or given merchandise. But I think if, a, if an influencer is able to have a very honest and transparent relationship with their listeners or viewers, I think they can have a lot of sway. I think it's a, it's a definite strategy that brands can, can employ. Mm -hmm. now this one's, um, I, I'll take this one because coming from someone who's just starting a small business and, uh, wants to get your perspective on, you know, how should he balance his focus between building out the brand and vision over the next three, five years, or, you know, focusing on the operations and making sure that, um, you know, he's profitable? That's a very good question. My instinct always is to map out your brand personality first and foremost what you stand for, what your mission is, what makes you different, what is your unique personality, what makes your company unique, because I feel everything springs from those decisions, even operational decisions will spring from your point of view and, and how you want to differ in the marketplace. So I'm a big fan of getting that right first and then everything else comes. So have you seen anything, Terry, in the last six or eight months coming from a small business that you believe was super effective uh, in terms of emotion during the pandemic, uh, how it, how this small business made people feel about it? I'd have to think about that. One of the things I've seen uh, quite a bit of during the, during the pandemic is some interesting marketing from very small independent breweries, craft breweries. I find them really interesting. Uh, you know, they're, they're making, so you can just have curb pickup, but I love the, the thought process going on in craft breweries right now, just how crazy and outrageous every beer is, you know, Flying Monkey is, you know, just a great brand and they've really busted the walls down in the, in, you know, the Molson Canadian or Bad Blue, they've really kind of kicked open the doors on that uh, category, which is small, small budgets, 
but they've done well and they catch my eye and they're doing business during the pandemic. So my, I tip my hat to them. I know we started our conversation um, with talking about brand names and, you know, as you mentioned flying monkeys, I wanted to ask you these, you know, unusual um, sort of out of the box brand names, unexpected labels that people put. Um, do you believe that uh, this, this uh, gives a different kind of meaning, you know, flying monkeys versus Molson Canadian? Yeah, I, I like it. I think it's, um, I think it opens up the possibilities for great marketing too. I think if you have a brand called Flying Monkey, I think just that lends itself to a certain type of, of bold marketing. And I'm such a fan of bold marketing. And I think a, a bold brand name gives you a leg up. It makes you memorable. And as I said earlier in our talk, you know, uh, uh, attention is the oxygen of marketing. And I think uh, Flying Monkey gets a lot more attention than a more conservative uh, brand name. I just do. Awesome. Uh, here's something really interesting. Uh, one of our listeners is asking, is nostalgia, it's very specific, is nostalgia the most effective emotion to utilize in marketing? If so, why? And if not, which emotion is it as per well, Terry? Uh, I think it is a uh, emotion you can tap if it's relevant for the brand. Uh, you, it's, that's an impossible question to answer, Mandeep, because it's case by case. I mean, every brand has different goals and different problems and different objectives and different strategies. So what, what emotion is right for one brand is not right for the other. And I always say the thing about marketing is there's no definites and always. It's sometimes and maybe. You know, it's, uh, it's really an art that, that's very liquid. So it, you can't just say this always works because it is never the case. Mm -hmm. And now, um, hopefully, you know, 2021 will be different. Um, we'll have no nostalgia about 2020, that I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. But as, as things open up, it, you know, as, uh, as, it, as life turn ar turns around and goes back to normal, is there a transitional tone that you would want brands to take on and is there some sort of you know brightness and hope and anticipation you would want them to create uh, you know would you want them to uplift people out of this pandemic i would hope so i think if we do return first of all we're never going to return to normal it'll be a brand new normal so many things will have changed when I look at 9-11 and what that did to the world and did to our industry, which was really a North American phenomenon in, in many ways, this pandemic is a worldwide phenomenon. So the changes that this pandemic is going to fuel, we don't even know yet. So the normal we'll return to will be a new normal. But I, I think that once we sort of see the horizon and see that we can sort of get back to being together and doing many of the things we used to do. I think the optimism is going to just be huge. I think you can see the stock market soar. You're gonna see brands come out with incredible positive messaging. So I suspect that's definitely going to happen. And one question that's fairly a constant in all our lives now, Terry, you know, with technology leading us, with uh, social media leading us and sort of engulfing our lives. Um, how do you see that affecting the field of marketing as well? You know, as someone said long, long time ago, the medium is the message. Yeah. Right? And this medium that is ever evolving, ever so flippant, um, you know, it creates relationships with some demographics, completely isolates others. Yes. Do you believe this medium has the same power that television, radio, and newspapers have delivered for half a century? Again, it may be a case by case basis, Mandeep, but I think the overriding answer to that is yes. I think social media is very powerful. It doesn't reach everybody, you know, it doesn't reach a, an older demographic. And remember that the oldest demographic right now, which is 55 plus, has all the money. And they're very ignored by marketers. 
But I think it's very hard to sell on social media. You have to be very careful because it's social media. So it's, it's hard to sell constantly because people will just ignore you and stop following you. So it's, whereas on television, it's all about selling or radio or print, but social media is a little different. The tone is, is, is a little unusual there. So it's a matter of creating a relationship so that you have this back and forth with your customers and potential customers. So when you do want to sell something, it's, it's welcomed, but it can't be 24 hours, you know, 24 seven selling on social media. It doesn't work. So, uh, you know, something I discovered a few years ago where Google, besides being a part of our lives every day, was doing a lot of publishing uh, for marketeers on consumer journeys, right? From consumers becoming aware of a problem or an opportunity or a product or service to going through their decision journey before they come to um, you know, making a choice and committing themselves. Um, how do you see, you know, emotion playing a role along a consumer's decision journey, right? Do you see different emotions from the start to the middle to the finish? Is it the same emotion that's carrying through a brand? That's, that's a really great question. <clears throat> I've always said that marketing a product is sort of like a book. In other words, it has many chapters in it. It isn't just one thing that happens because I think smart marketers look at that journey and say, what do we have to convince somebody of? What are the four steps they ha we have to convince them of before they'll consider our product? Like it may need four beats before the product seems like the inevitable solution or, or as a, you know, a great solution to that problem. And I think those, those beats all have individual what would I call them? Like little ecosystems of emotion. So you might be like unsure, and then you might be skeptical, and then you might be, uh, you know, uh, amazed, and then you might want to then make the the decision to buy that product. But I think great marketing is chapters. And I remember Bruce Springsteen once said uh, he's a, he he looks at his fan base like they're having a lifelong conversation, and you can't lose track of the plot. In other words, you can't suddenly go backwards and say something against something you had said before, because everybody, in, especially in the social media world, keeps very good account of where you stand and what you've said in the past and everything never goes away anymore. So what you've said is out there somewhere. So it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this is my, my personal question to you. Um, in the face of economic, you know, when people are making an economic choice, is marketing being manipulative by in introducing emotion, by distracting them from that economic choice, that payoff, that return on investment, and instead getting them um, caught up in this bundle of emotions such that they ignore the economics and they end up making a commitment uh, you know, of buying a home they cannot afford, buying a car that they cannot continue to pay down three years later. I missed the first part of that, Mandeep, but I think I know you're, where you were going with that. I think it all comes down to, and this is a big theme in my radio show for the past 15 years, is that marketers have accountability. There's a responsibility to not manipulate uh, their, their customers and to, you know, the insurance industry, you've seen a change there where they always used fear historically, that if you didn't have the right home insurance, you might lose your home or you might, you know, lose your, your car in an accident or a limb and you'll never get repaid. All of that has kind of changed over time. So you see a lot of humor in the insurance category right now. So I think, what that tells me is a category that has been built on fear is seeing that that's manipulative. So they've kind of really, and I think there are, there are uh, kind of the, the hood ornament for this discussion right now that they've really chosen to go a different way and not be as manipulative as, the, as that industry has, has been historically. So I think marketers need to take responsibility for that. Awesome. I'll take one last question, Terry, and then bring this discussion to a close. 
And this is, uh, you know, I think this is uh, someone trying to learn from you. And people are saying, hey, um, now you are a brand. I am a brand. How do I market brand me, brand I, brand you? Um, you know, there are workshops that happen in this space where, uh, you know, trainers will come in and say, let me show you how to, um, I, you know, how to market brand you. About two or three seasons ago, Mandeep, I did an episode on that very topic, how to, how to market your, your personal brand. And what was interesting about that episode was it was the most listened to episode of that season which is always surprising to me when I look back on a season and I'll, I'll make an assumption of what show is probably going to be the most popular. And I would never have chosen that one, but it was by far the most listened to, which tells you that that question is on a lot of people's minds. And in that episode, I said, take the lessons from the big brands. In other words, be true to yourself, figure out a, a unique way to present yourself, be consistent don't be flippant. Even your email address uh, is important. It says a lot about you. Like party bunny at Gmail is not a great email address to send out when you're doing business or at least separate your business from your personal emails. And like all, all the touch points you have with your in your business, if we're talking business, make sure that everything you send out is professional and feels like, you know, my shish kebab theory, Mandeep, that everything should feel like it's coming from the same place that the skewer on a shish kebab is the is the marketing strategy that everything you know everything on on the skewer meaning your business cards your website your tweets your instagram posts all feel like they're coming from the same place even though all the messages are different meaning that your tonality is true so that's what big brands do that are successful and i think personal brands should do the same thing that's well said and i think that's a good note to close on Terry, uh, know who you are and be true to yourself, whether you are you or you are a brand and stay consistent. Uh, thanks so much, Terry. Uh, that was uh, quite the conversation. We went a little bit over. I appreciate your patience. Um, we had an audience of over 400 people joining us today. Thank you to our listeners who are here, our viewers who are here. Uh, you know, stay tuned, more to come. If there are any lingering questions you have, send them our way and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Have a fun uh, holiday season. Be safe, uh, stay healthy, and we'll catch all of you in the new year. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Thanks, everybody. Take care.